Teaching While Queer is a podcast for LGBTQIA plus teachers, administrators, and well, anyone who works in academia to share their stories. Hi, my name is Brian Stanton, a queer theater educator in San Antonio, Texas. Each week, I bring you stories from around the world centered on the experiences of LGBTQIA folks in academia. Thank you for joining me on this journey and enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Teaching While Queer. We hope that you enjoyed your winter break. We are back with new episodes. And today I have the pleasure to speak with Toronto based teacher, Monsieur Steve. Hello. Yes. C'est moi, Monsieur Steve. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure. So tell me a little bit about you. What do you teach? I am a grade two, three French immersion teacher here in Toronto. Uh, For those who don't know what French immersion is, it means that I am a classroom homeroom teacher. I teach everything. Just so happens to be it's all in French. That's super cool. We do have, uh, my daughter is in a Spanish immersion program here in San Antonio. So she gets the, the joy of getting the same kind of curriculum done, but in Spanish. Ah, I guess that makes sense that it would be Spanish. Yeah. Closer to the school. Over on that side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. All right. Uh, but in addition, but as I say, in addition to being a, a classroom teacher, I'm also a teacher on the World Wide Web, as I have a YouTube channel, aptly named Monsieur Steve, where I, I kind of do my shtick, but in a video format. I love that. I've actually seen quite a few of your videos. That's actually how we connected on social media. Um, it sure is. Yeah. And so you've got a lot of great stuff there. And uh, I would love to be able to spotlight that later on in our episode. But let's take a journey kind of back in time, if you will. Um, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about what life was like for you as you were coming to terms with who you are as a young person? Oh, do we have to? <laughs> I know, that's the rough uh, stuff. The Hard-hitting questions use, here. Uh, uh, I would go with the word traumatic on that one. Uh, my upbringing was anything but normal. Uh, I knew I was different from a very young age. I think I realized that difference was pretty pronounced around five years old. Um I mean, I didn't really come to terms with it and really fully embrace and accept it until I was about 16. But uh, I knew I was different, and I, I struggled very much so with that. As I grew up in a fairly religious household, um, and I know that's not an uncommon sort of roadblock for queer youth to overcome, but it's one that I had to endure. And in addition to that, I was forced to go to Catholic school, and uh, it was not easy when you have very opposing viewpoints from your own sort of being force fed, um, which clouded my ability to sort of see myself for who I was and, and, and to love myself, uh, consequently. Um, so it was quite the tumultuous upbringing and, uh, journey to self discovery, but, uh, I really fell in love and embraced who I was with the help of friends that I made in the rave scene back in the 90s. I'm dating myself. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but, I can just uh, see yeah, no. the colorful bracelets and necklaces and pants right now. Yeah, I mean, I kind of still dress <laughs> with, with that sort of color scheme in mind. But, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't an easy road. Uh, but, I mean, that journey brought me to where I am today, and it's one of the biggest sort of proponents for – my being an educator today was to get in there and help youth who need that guidance, who need that role model, because definitely didn't get that in my upbringing and certainly not in my education. In fact, I got the opposite. I would get told that, you know, being gay is a sin and, you know, that's the kind of thing you should suppress. Uh, and definitely not the kind of stuff that we you know tell our, our our students these days right agreed i have simple i uh, had a similar upbringing in the sense of the time frame i am am lucky in that my parents while they may have had religion in their heart did not like have religion in our household um my mom still 
says that she is Catholic and uh, abides by beliefs that happen within the Catholic Church. But we never had it as a as children. Like my brothers and I were never really exposed to the church, so I think that made sure. my journey much much easier than those at the time because it's also doubly hard when we're coming off of the back of the AIDS pandemic. Like, yep. Yep. For you're going to sure. die I, or burn in hell or both. So listen, I have absolutely no issue with religion so long as it doesn't, you know, impact anybody negatively and makes someone else feel like who they are as a person is unacceptable. That's where I draw the line and say, okay, well, that's not cool. Uh, I actually tried to get out of being in that Catholic school because I was bullied. I was picked on. It was absolute torture going to that school. So uh, I was actually uh, a bass player, and uh, there's a school next door to mine that was called ESA, aptly named by my fellow students at the Catholic school I went to as ES Gay because anybody who was an art student was obviously gay. Obviously. Right? I mean, it's just logical. Uh, so I filled the application out and I did my in-person, uh, like you perform and I got accepted. So I signed the documents on behalf of my parents and I got into the school, which was a big deal because they don't accept a lot of people. And my plans were foiled when they called home and parents were like, what? Absolutely not. He is not going to that school. And I was forced to continue my torture at that other school where kids would say things, such sweet, sweet things like, I hope you die. I hope you kill yourself. Uh, it was really nice, you know, going to school and having that kind of experience <laughs> really makes you feel welcomed. Yep. I think it's so interesting, too, because now those things are like actual crimes. Like if a child says right? that to another child right now, it's an actual crime. So in yeah. some ways, we've come a very long way in a good direction, um, at least as far as working towards keeping people safe in educational environments. Sure. And that's, that's great. I mean, that's kind of why we're here, right? We're doing this, we're sharing our stories so that kids don't end up where we were. Yep. Absolutely. How do you think that your experience has informed you as a teacher? Like what do you take from your past that you kind of hold dear to bring to your students? Wow. That's a loaded question because there's so many things that sort of I bring with me. Number one is listening, listening to my kids, listening to them when they speak, because people just didn't listen to me. Like, no one really cared. It was like my way or the highway sort of situation. No one was like, oh, well, why do you feel this way? Or why do you think you feel this way? Like, there was never those kinds of questions. So number one is being there for the kids and listening. Uh, and I create the safest space I possibly can by reminding the kids that, A, it's okay to not know who you are yet, to just roll with it, just learning to love yourself, uh, being comfortable enough to make mistakes, take risks, challenge yourself in a way that's, like, positive. Uh, you know, we were, I mean, it still happens, but, like, the pressure to do well and without ridicule was so hard back then. Like, I, you know, you, you'd succumb to it. And even teachers would pressure you to the point where I had teachers who, you know, if you made a mistake, they'd call you out in front of the entire class. So, like, every negative experience I had in a classroom has, you know, shaped who I am as a teacher because I think back to all those things that happened. And I'm like, all right, well, I know how to do this. Just don't do any of the things my former teachers did. And that's sort of been what I do, right? Like, uh, and I use those awful experiences as teachable moments. So if a kid has, uh, I don't know, something happens in the classroom, they feel ashamed or they feel sad about it. I will dig deep into that sack of mine and pull out a memory and share it with them in in an age appropriate way, obviously, depending on what the story is. Uh, And then that sort of normalizes a, what they're feeling and it B it gives them sort of a, a transparency into my life that, that helps us connect and, I feel like, honestly, my 12 years of teaching, again, dating myself, uh, I have had 12 phenomenal groups of students who I've bonded with in a way that I still feel connected to them. Like, I'll run into students here and there, and it's brilliant to see that they still care and reach out. Uh, even on Instagram, I'll have you know students be like, oh, my God, Mr. Steve, I'm an adult now, <laughs> which is terrifying. <laughs> but uh, 
cool. It really is. I've had that experience recently. I have a, I have a former student who is looking for jobs as a teacher for next school year. And I was like, wait, you're done. You're done with college. Like, what? 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 <laughs> when did that happen? Um, so trippy. Right. You're an adult now. It's wild. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, your age group. Like you're working with second, third grade immersion. I sure am. Yeah. And that is, it's a hot topic age group because especially in America, I know your laws aren't, um, well, I'm not seeing international headlines that indicate that people on the conservative side are being as radical in, in Canada as they are in America. And we're dealing with issues of like, when's it even appropriate to say the word gay? And for some reason, like second, third grade has become that kind of battleground of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, because you're one of the few elementary teachers I've had on this program, like, how do you handle sensitive topics in your classroom if they come up? But like for us here, it's just a, it's a normal vocabulary word. Like, it's in the curriculum for us to teach about different kinds of families and we're encouraged to do so. Like my school board has posters that say positive space for our, our, our shared areas uh, in the primary and kindergarten areas. So we're actually mandated to discuss those topics. Uh, do we have people who push back? Absolutely. But when they push back, it comes from a place of, I don't want to say, I say ignorance, but not in a judgmental way. Just they lack the knowledge to understand what it is we're actually doing in our classes when we talk about these different kinds of families and we use the word gay because you'll have pushback from parents who say, I don't want you teaching my kids about sex. Listen, that is a fair thing to request. And I, as a teacher, do not want to talk to your grade two, three students about sex. I am talking to your grade two, three student, your child about love and families and caring and loving yourself. That's the difference. We're presenting facts. It is a fact that you can have two men and a kitty cat as a family. It's mine. It, it's real. It exists. It's empirical evidence I'm sharing with my students. Uh, it is a fact that you can have a blended family, that a child can have two moms and two dads, could have a mom and two dads. There are so many varieties of families, and those kids are in our classrooms. So if you neglect to show them a window into their lives vis-a-vis -vis books, posters, anecdotal stories, then you're denying them access to their own lives, being reflected back at them. So I think here at least uh, in Canada, I can't speak for everybody, but I do feel like we are more at liberty to do the right thing, which is to teach the truth. Uh, and I, I, I know I see headlines from the states and I, I, you know, I get really upset because some of the things that are proposed are just outlandish, like books that are being banned and the attacks on the queer community, like drag queens reading storybooks. Like, I think it's great. I love it. But, you know, there's definitely pushback on that and it becomes a dangerous thing to be doing. Like, how is that more dangerous than taking kids to on a hunting trip? Or like, I, I just, I have a hard time wrapping my head around how some people can accept some things that are truly dangerous and others that could actually broaden and, you know, make, you know, have a child open up and, and become more accepting and loving. But that's the dangerous thing. So, I mean, again, it boils down to us being very lucky and very blessed that in Canada we do have support and, and legislation and rules that allow me to teach about those topics without having to worry about, you know, oh, gosh, is this parent TV going to come after me? I mean, it's always there in the back of my head because you never know how a family will perceive what their child come home, comes home and says. Because kids can also take what you say out of context or misconstrue, or full-on lie about what you said, if they want to. I mean, I've never had that experience, but I know other people who have. So, I don't know. I, uh, 
I feel supported and able to talk about those things. I've never had issues. I've never even had pushback from a student, let alone family. So, I mean, actually, I had pushback once from a student when they were in grade one. It was my second year teaching, and I was doing one of my lessons. I was reading a book by Todd Carr, I think. It was like uh, uh, about having two dads. And the student's face was like, what? He's like, no, you can't. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you can't have two men together. It's always a man and a woman. I'll never forget that. And his face was so like, I don't understand. Does not compute. What are you telling me? And he got a bit upset. But later on, he, he understood that I wasn't doing anything but explaining how that that does exist. I wasn't trying to tell him that it, it, it exists in your family, mm-hmm. in other families. So again, very lucky, very blessed. Uh, but I feel, I feel for every teacher who is torn between doing what they know and feel is right in their heart and having to choose silence uh, for safety and security reasons. It's, it's a situation I hope I've never had in, in that situation. I think it's crazy that we're neighboring and yet there's such a huge disconnect between, I guess, values. Um, yeah, I mean, because I, I, I think about right now where there are folks that are trying to mandate that we cannot speak about and LGBTQ inclusive education like does not exist really in the States. Um, and I'm assuming as a as a 12 year veteran teacher that you were kind of around when that legislation, when the mandates started coming in or was it before you began teaching? Uh, I feel like it was before I, I began teaching. So your whole teaching Honestly. experience, you've been able to be, uh, being able to have an inclusive curriculum that allows you to talk about yeah. everyone. That's yeah. wild. Wild. Yeah. We, like at my school, I organized a flag raising ceremony. And I, my first year teaching, I was part of what we called a Power of Words Week, which was an anti-bullying, anti-homophobia assembly uh, that we had for the kids. It was an entire week of celebrating our differences and celebrating love of all forms. So, yeah, no, this has been part of my life uh, since I became a teacher. I do recall when I first started, I was still like, I don't know, what can I share? Like, what's safe? What's considered, like, appropriate? So I did ease into it. Like, when I say ease into it, just uh, like lessons on those topics. And it's still, yes, it was it was something people were really able to discuss with their students. I just didn't know what was appropriate for every grade level. So I, I, I and, and I kept certain parts of my personal life private. Like I never shared uh, about my partner, and I just kept that stuff to myself. Now she's out and she's proud. Like mm-hmm. uh, I have, I have. There's no secrets uh, with the parent community. Everyone knows who I am. I mean, I guess now I mean, because of my YouTube channel and being able to use and stuff, they know who I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have to hide any parts of my life and it feels so wonderful to just be really unabashedly 100% me, Mrs. C. That's awesome. I feel like that is a, a huge battle, especially for those in the LGBTQ community because there's such this stigma um, as in the U.S. right now about even just being a part of the community, you're problematic. I was just listening to a podcast of a gentleman in Kentucky who was like, I can't even identify. Like, if I would have identified, I would have been excommunicated from the church or uh, banished or whatever the situation is. And that's such a reality even now in 2022 or 2023. Oh, my God, that's the first time I've done that. Um, but as a reality here in 2023 of things that I heard horror stories about in the nineties. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. The nineties were terrible. And, uh, even teachers here, you'd be ridiculed and made fun of for, for speaking your truth, which is, you know, ridiculous. So we have come a long way, uh, at least here in Canada, but I mean, don't get me wrong. We still have our fair share of those who would love to see any mention of, uh, you know, the LGBTQ to spirit plus community sort of wiped out from the curriculum, right? Like, so we have our, we have those people here too, right? 
it's not just a U.S. problem. It's a worldwide problem. Sure. Uh, we just happen to have the right people who have been in power who have made decisions to protect our ability to share our truths and the reality of, you know, queer people living amongst us. It's not, you can't just under rug swept everything. Like, I don't understand what all these bannings and, uh, like, banning the word gay, what, what are you, what are you achieving by holding that word from, you know, the ears of grade two, grade three kids? Because in doing that, you might have students in your school who are saying, oh, my family isn't okay because we're not allowed to talk about my family. But, you know, Joe's family, his mom and dad, they can talk about that kind of family, no problem. So you're sending the wrong message to these kids. Like, you're saying that their families aren't, like, real, right? By saying that we don't want you talking about gay, that you're sort of trying to wipe out an entire existence. Like, that's what I hear when you say that, don't say gay, like, that don't say gay bill made me so upset because... No, we're going to say gay because gay people exist. Gay parents exist and they have kids and those kids go to school. And if you're saying that that's a word that has to be stricken from the records at school, you're sending a horrible message to those kids. I agree. That's actually one of my concerns. There's currently, I think, three uh, anti-LGBTQ plus bills in the Texas uh, legislature. So that's where I'm from or where I am hailing at now. Um, and that's one of my concerns is that my children, my personal children will be silenced because they're not allowed to speak their truth because their truth is connected to my truth. And I think that's, it's wild, um, to think that people, uh, believe that their opinions are more powerful than the truth that's out there. You mentioned, I'm just teaching facts. I'm teaching that you can have a relationship between two men. You can have a relationship between a man and a woman. You can have a relationship this way and that. And it's just a fact. And so many people are trying to contest facts due to their opinions. Yeah. That's 100% the root cause of this problem is that people's opinions are trying to be pushed through as facts. But our facts are trying to be pushed out completely. Make it make sense. I can't. <laughs> it's, it, is a, it is something that I find mind-boggling every day, and every, every day I see a new headline that I'm like, are you serious right now? Yeah. It's, and then, you know, I try and, and support you guys down there by making reels about it and spreading the word, but like, Ultimately, it's in the hands of the you know, the politicians down there, and it go it boils down to voting for the right politician. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know the the, the your political system down there is an enigma wrapped in an enigma. Like I don't understand it at all. Your voting process is is so complicated, but I I still do believe that it boils down to voting for the right person, right? Yep. And getting out there and voting. Getting out there and voting is the most important part. I mean, the turnout for elections is ridiculous, but there's also quite a bit of political gerrymandering and um, p- voter suppression that is happening in areas that's making it incredibly difficult. And so it's hard. The system, honestly, needs to be redone uh, we're <laughs> relying on something that's not even 300 years old. Like the city of San Antonio is older than the United States, um, as well as several other cities in this country, um, and are steeped in traditions that are beyond the traditions of this country even. And we're relying on some guys who didn't have the technology we have, that didn't have the access that we have, that didn't have a way of communicating in the mass like we have, and we're saying that, you know, what they said went, is fine. They had to send a guy on a horse yeah. to a bunch of cities to communicate that a war was happening, <laughs> and we're supposed yeah. to equate it to living life with the internet. 
Yeah, I think things have changed. So, I mean, I don't see the harm in updating systems that seem to be on the outdated side, right? But, I mean, if you can't get out and vote and you can't make change, then I understand. But if you're able to vote, go and vote. I hate hearing people say, well, my vote's not going to make a difference. You don't actually know that. Like, what if in the results, the person you voted for lost out by a hundred and there's a hundred people out there who go, Oh man, if only I voted, but right. your vote can actually make a difference. We can make change. The system exists for a reason. Yeah. It's set up in a way that makes failure very easy, but I think we can, and we should incite change. And that change really isn't going to happen until people get out and voice their opinions through voting. I agree. I'm looking at things like, I don't know, this week in the headlines in France, there were protests like all over the country because all they were doing was trying to change the year of retirement, push it back two years. And the whole, whole country was in an uproar. And I was like, that's how people make their voice heard. Like (laughs) we need that kind of energy right now um, in lots of areas to help make some progress happen here. But we also got to focus on, you know, things that are helping make change. Uh, Look, one of the things that I love so much in the U.S. is the TV show We're Here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've watched it. It's an HBO masterpiece. Okay. And just seeing that window into those small towns in the South is so eye-opening. It's terrifying because you see how difficult it must be being a queer person uh, or any one who doesn't fit the norm down there and how brave you must be to fight for, you know, those rights, like to fight for visibility. And I just love that show because it's, it's, it's opening the eyes of so many to what, what it means to be a part of our community. And there's so much misinformation that equates our li- our lives as a lifestyle, quote unquote, as being you know, pretty sex fueled. And it's just that that's not who we are. It's not what our community is. It's so much more than that. It is a loving, fun, loving community that embraces those on the fringes, on the outskirts. And uh, it's all about love and peace and unity. And I, I, it's, it's so hard when you hear and see people just hate on us and drag queens and, they just don't get it. I'm like, how can you have a problem with love? Like, I just, I, I, how is our love for someone of the same sex or someone who, anyone who's different from the norm, how does that impact you negatively? Like, what's, what's it doing that's got you so upset? I don't get it. I don't get it either. I think, I think it's hard also because, um, many of the folks who are in an outrage will also preach love, (laughs) you know? And so the contradictory uh, behavior, the hypocrisy of it kind of drives me crazy. Yeah, I feel you. But we have to just hold on for hope. And, you know, I see these kids every day and I see the love in their hearts and, and that light hasn't gone out yet. Like they're all, Show, they still show affection, like the boys show affection to each other, the girls show affection to each other. It hasn't been like hammered out of them yet. That that I don't you know I know you know what I'm talking about because like all little kids like just love unabashedly. Mm-hmm. There's been no judgment. It's not oh he's a boy oh she's a girl. But when they get to a certain age, it gets hammered out by you know what they see in the media, what, all the critiques and the criticism and the judgments they get from the world around them. And then they're taught, well, I'm a boy. Well, I can't show affection to my other friend who's a boy. Uh, I can't wear nail polish. I can't. It's, it's, I hate it. But I know we're moving away from that, which is great. Like you see longer and longer the kids are sticking to it or even deciding that no, that's who I am. But you still see those who, who revert and completely push away from that. And if that's what they want and that's what makes them happy, totally cool. But if it's someone who wants to embrace that side of themselves but is afraid to because society says they can't, it breaks my heart. 
I agree. I I watch my kids kind of change, right? I have three teenagers and I have an eight year old, and she is at the stage where pretty soon you're gonna start. I'm gonna start seeing the the societal impacts. Yeah. So it's inevitable. It really is. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit in the last uh, <clears throat> few minutes uh, to talk a little bit about your kind of global education, your YouTube channel. What's happening on your YouTube channel? Sure. Uh, well, I'll give you a little quick run on how it started. Uh, so it was, it was birthed out of the pandemic. Uh, I, I knew I had to do something to sort of help out. And I decided to come up with uh, videos. I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I literally filmed in portrait mode and not landscape. Like, I didn't know how to make YouTube videos. And it lasted for a while. But uh, after a whole bunch of time, uh, I took, you know, I did tutorials and spent my whole summer figuring it out. Uh, Yeah, I I, I decided to put a lot of time and effort into it. And because of the pandemic, a lot of, you know, kids were being taught at home and resources were scarce. So these videos were a way for teachers to access things that they couldn't do on their own. Like, it's hard to teach topics. Uh, It's hard to teach without all the tools that we had at school if we were stuck at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also saw uh, a gap in terms of quality videos that engage kids on a fun level because learning French can be a little bit dry, (laughs) depending on the teacher. And that's fine. Everyone has a different teaching style, no no judgment. Uh, But uh, I want to just spice things up and spice things up I did. And uh, my YouTube channel did pretty well. Uh, You know, it ended up being used across classrooms in Canada, all over from coast to coast, and even places in the States that have, like, teachers reaching out. Like, I had one uh, in Texas, actually, uh, who uses my videos, and she was using them with her grade 7 and 8, which was totally shocking to me. I'm like, to see the picture of a group of kids in Texas, grade 8, watching me with a puppet teaching French. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's wild, uh, but super cool. And I've used my platform as a way to absolutely teach, you know, curriculum-based content. But I've made it fun, and I've also made a few videos, uh, you know, ensuring that there's, you know, inclusivity there, that there's visibility, that they're not just seeing one type of family or one type of skin color, but everybody feels represented and seen in all my examples. That I use. I'll have, you know, a video where I'll say a word, and then I'll show a picture of someone doing that thing. So I make sure that I find lots of different types of examples so that everyone feels seen and represented. Awesome. And where can people find you on YouTube? Uh, it's very easy. It is Mr. Steve. Just type in, in Mr. Steve into the search engine and I'm the first thing that pops up. Awesome. And that's your social media handle as well. Instagram? Yeah, Instagram and TikTok. Mr. Steve all the way. Awesome. Teachers, if you are teaching French, go out and check it out. I know that all of our like our students start learning their second languages during secondary school. So middle school, high school. So that's probably where you're seeing the grade seven, eights ah. watching the video because we don't actually start language ed- education unless you're in an immersive program, um, at an earlier age. So, um, kudos to that teacher in Texas using the resources. Yes. Um, I think that's fantastic. I've got one last question for you before we sure. wrap up. Um, Say you were talking with a brand new educator. They are queer, but unsure how to be their authentic self in the classroom. What advice would you give them on, you know, living their best life while at work? Well, first of all, you have to be comfortable. So I would tell them to only share what they're comfortable sharing. Uh, There's no reason to be afraid of talking to your kids about your life. If you're professional and smart about it, like you're not going to be divulging things that are inappropriate. We never were teachers. We know better than that. But sharing a bit about your life, if you're a queer person, is giving a kid in your class who might identify and doesn't know it quite yet a chance to be themselves future and late in the future. They might think back and go, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I remember him. He made me feel comfortable. You know what? It's okay to be gay. It's okay to be trans. Like, it's those leaps that we take as educators and sharing a bit of ourselves that will truly impact and make a difference in a kid's life down the road. 
But if you yourself are not comfortable or you feel afraid or you feel unsafe, then of course, do not push yourself. But if you know if there's no actual reason for you to be afraid to be who you are, then take that leap. Do it because you never know who's going to benefit from it. That is great advice. Thank you so much for your time today, Mr. Steve. Well, Mr. Brian, thank you so much for having me here. It was a pleasure. Awesome. I wish you would bring some of your warmer Texas weather, not your weather up today, as I know not it is. Not today. It is today. very freezing here. But, uh, you know, we need it up here. We have, we've only seen the sun for like 30 minutes in the past like 30 days. Yeesh. My yeah, kids want to move great. to colder spaces, and then they remember this one week out of the year where we get freezing weather, and they're like, never mind. Tell them they're always welcome to swap with me. I have no <laughs> problem. You might regret that after uh, uh, 45 <laughs> days of constant 100-degree weather. You know what? You don't know me well enough to know that that's what <laughs> I feel. As long as there's a body of water nearby, I'm good. Fair enough. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Teaching While Queer. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Teaching While Queer. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing on your favorite RSS feed and sharing the podcast with your friends and family. New episodes will come out every other week during the school year. If you're interested in joining us on this Teaching While Queer podcast, please email us at teachingwhilequeerpodcast at gmail.com. Have a great day.